This is Josh McIntyre. Josh graduated 2017. 2017. Computer science major. Works at Microsoft of all crazy places. Um, but he loves cryptocurrency. So this is not his job. This is his passion, his avocation kind of stuff. And he did, last year he came into these same classes and did a fantastic job. Um, does a lot better than our full-time professor. So we thought we'd have him back because he can talk about this and we'll understand it. We actually can understand. He's not going to bury, bury you or me in the jargon. So this is an opportunity to really learn something about what's going on with this stuff. I'm sure you've all heard about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is the, the general generic title for a lot of this stuff. But Josh is going to spend some time with you on it today. He's going to allow a goodly amount of Q&A, so please do the interaction with him. Uh, and class is yours. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Dr. Abramovic uh, for having me back again. I, I really enjoy doing this, and I appreciate the kind words. So I hope it's you know informative, engaging for everybody today, uh, like it was last year. Yeah. So this is going to be the McKenna School Guide to Cryptocurrencies. So this is not going to be the guide to cryptocurrencies for engineer nerds like me. So if you're not super technical, you don't have to worry about getting lost. What we're going to talk about is a little bit about what cryptocurrencies are, some of the interesting properties that they have that makes them useful, and more importantly, why you might be interested in cryptocurrencies and blockchain tech as a finance professional. So as Dr. Abramovic said, I, I'm a software engineer at Microsoft in Pittsburgh. I work on stuff for Azure storage, and cryptocurrencies are not my day job, but I have you know, a, a strong technical background. I'm, I'm a coder. And uh, on the side, I run this website, uh, chaintoots.com. So I create videos, code projects, articles, and I like to teach people about these cryptocurrencies. So obviously, I have a strong passion and interest in this. So I like to be upfront about my biases and that sort of thing You know, when I'm giving a talk to, to people. Um, so I'm going to tell you cryptocurrencies are good. I'm probably not going to tell you that they're bad. So I thought it might be interesting this time around to start off with just a little poll around the room. How many of you have heard of cryptocurrencies? Heard of Bitcoin? OK, cool. So that's, that's a really strong presence in the room. How many of you have owned some of a cryptocurrency? So we got two. OK. And I'm going to extend this a little bit more. Out of the two of you, how many of you have done more than just hold a cryptocurrency? Have you ever spent it on something? Bought goods or services with it or traded it, maybe traded it with a friend? Just in kind of maybe the Coinbase side of things, buy some, see what the price does. That's cool. So what are cryptocurrencies? Fundamentally, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different things you might hear about them. They're a cool investment. You can make a lot of money on Bitcoin. Or, you know, this is what people use to buy drugs on the internet, which is also true and kind of cool if you ask me. Fundamentally, what cryptocurrencies are is they're a form of digital cash. <clears throat> we'll find out when we talk more about the properties of cryptocurrencies. They actually behave a lot more like a digital form of a dollar bill in your wallet than they do something like Venmo or PayPal that you might be used to. So here are some of what cryptocurrencies offer. It's a decentralized model. So unlike the money that we're used to, there's no corporations, no governments in control of the major cryptocurrencies. So there are some private blockchains out there, but the ones that we're talking about, like Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, nobody's in charge of them. They're censorship resistant. So you can take your money, you can send money to anyone you want, anywhere in the world, and nobody can stop that payment from happening. Payments are global. So you can send money to anyone anywhere. There's no limits, there's no giant fees, there's no sanctions, anything like that. It's an entirely global currency and economy. And cryptocurrencies are a form of sound money. There's a limited supply for each of these cryptocurrencies, or for most of them. The way that these currencies are issued is a lot more predictable than our fiat money. So let's talk a little bit more about decentralization and what that means. <clears throat> these cryptocurrencies, like Bitcoin, they're built on peer-to-peer -peer software protocols. So 
Be honest with me, I'm not, I'm not your dad. How many of you have used a file sharing program like BitTorrent to download a file? Maybe something you didn't want to pay for, or maybe some open source software. You use that, right? That's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So when you hop on BitTorrent, you're communicating with a bunch of other people that are running that same software program to download bits and pieces of a file and put it together. You're not downloading it from a central server. And these cryptocurrencies work in the same way. People are just running the Bitcoin software or the Litecoin software on their computers. And the software is designed that you communicate back and forth. And there's no need for like a central server or a central company to determine what happens on the network. So it's just a broader community of users, developers, and what are called miners. I will get to that in a little bit. They're making decisions for how these currencies work and deciding what is valid transactions, invalid, and that sort of thing. There's no corporate, there's no regulatory concerns, political concerns in general that govern cryptocurrencies. Now I know you're all finance people and we'll talk a little bit more about how this ties into maybe the more traditional banking system a little bit later. But in general, when you're talking about Bitcoin, there's really nothing regulating it or you know, stopping transactions from happening. It's, kind of, it's really a truly free currency market. So compare this to credit cards. What are credit cards designed to do? Make credit card companies money, right? They don't, you know, Visa doesn't give you a credit card. Uh, American Express doesn't give you a credit card for free because they have your best interests at heart. You know, they have, they have shareholder interests. They have those things that they're beholden to. This is one of, I think, the most interesting properties of this, and this is censorship resistance. Because Bitcoin is decentralized, because it's just a peer-to-peer -peer network of people running software together, there's no censorship. No intermediate party can decide what you can do with your money to make a transaction. So if you want to send money to you, you can just do it. It's a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. Compare this to Venmo or PayPal. If you want to send money to your friend over here through PayPal, it's not really a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. PayPal sits in the middle. So PayPal is this, the trusted authority that verifies that you have $100 that you're sending to your friend. They make sure that you're not doing it for some illegal, nefarious reason or you know, sending it to somebody that you're not supposed to. And they ultimately decide whether or not that transaction is going to be allowed to go through. With Bitcoin, it doesn't matter. If it's a valid transaction, if you have $100 worth of Bitcoin in your wallet and you create a transaction to a new address, if that transaction follows the rules of the protocol, that transaction will go through. So you might be saying, well, I mean, are people just gonna use this for illegal things? Well, no, this actually has a lot of really interesting and valid use cases for, for legitimate purposes. Um, What's a new legal emerging industry in a lot of states right now? It's cannabis, right? Medical, recreational, but cannabis is still illegal on a federal level. And so companies that are operating perfectly legal businesses in these states cannot deal with the banking system. If you're a marijuana grower or a dispensary in California or Colorado, you have to deal in cash, which actually becomes physically dangerous for you and your business because you become a target, right? You can't put your money safely in a bank like you would if you were any other business. PayPal and Venmo will not allow you to pay, pay for your weed uh, because they're beholden to those fe federal regulations. Um, I actually met a gentleman that's working on a project called Popcoin that is specifically designed for the legal cannabis industry. He's from Canada, he's a really great guy. He came down to visit us in Pittsburgh for a meetup. And uh, that's, you know, that's a really important use case when it comes to censorship resistance, right? Think of journalists and dissidents. They might be saying something that you don't like, but you know, cryptocurrency allows you to get past that censorship. It allows you to have a truly free market with your currency to buy what you want to buy, to say what you want to say with your, with your voting with your dollars. So again, compare this to credit and debit. Another really valid and interesting use case of this is our friend Edward Snowden. For those of you who don't know who he is, he was the leaker who revealed uh, the NSA spying programs uh, that have been going on for years sort of behind our backs. He wrote a new book recently, and the US government is actually suing him to try and seize the profits from this book. So any retailer in the US that sells his book, he's not gonna get the money from that. 
but you can use Bitcoin or a peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency to actually properly pay him for the work that he did for his book. And there's nobody that can do anything to stop that. And because of this decentralized nature and this censorship resistant nature, Bitcoin's also global. You can send money to anyone, anywhere. You can support an international cause that you believe in, send money to family overseas. There's no limit on amounts, no high fees, no sanctions lists, anything like that. So maybe you uh, came over to the US to do some work, right? You earn money, you want to send it back to your family back home. Compare this to Western Union. I actually checked on their website the other day, and for some countries, it starts at 8% for a wire transfer. And when you come from an impoverished place, that's a significant amount of money. They won't even serve some areas. I can't send money to Iran. What if I'm an Iranian immigrant, right? Canada has a, an, a very uh, strong Iranian immigrant population, they can't send money back to their family using a traditional service because it's censored. But with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, this is a global system, and so they can send money wherever they want to for fractions of a penny. It's there and cleared in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, depending on the network. And there you have it. I think that's really, really valuable compared to what we're currently dealing with in the financial system. And Bitcoin is sound money, and I think this is something that might interest the investment people and maybe the finance people, especially if you're a fan of the maybe Austrian economic side of things. Most major cryptocurrencies have a limited supply set by the protocol. So this protocol that everybody's agreeing to says that there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin Cash is a fork of Bitcoin that has the same supply limit. Litecoin has 84 million Litecoin. So that's all there will ever be. Some currencies like Ethereum don't have a cap, but it's still really good because the supply is predictable. When you know that every 15 seconds a new block is going to be mined and new, some new Ethereum are going to be issued, you know the pace at which the monetary supply is inflating. Now compare that to the US dollar. Does anybody know what the schedule is for the next time that the Federal Reserve is going to print more US dollars <coughs> to issue into supply? Anybody have any idea? Yeah, no one does, right? They can decide in the middle of the night to print trillions of more US dollars, and they do all the time. And that's inflating our dollars that we're earning out of value. It's something, what, like 3% a year, potentially. They say if you're not getting a 2 or 3% raise every year at work, you're not even beating inflation. It's kind of debasing the currency that we all place our faith in and, and hold our value in. And so this is something that cryptocurrencies do differently. And again, it's not even necessarily having a cap, like 21 million, even if you have an uncapped cryptocurrency, you can just look at the software and you know what the supply is going to be. You can look at the blockchain on a blockchain explorer and see exactly how many Ethereum are in existence, and you can calculate out if you want to know how many there's going to be tomorrow, how many there's going to be tomorrow. And that, that's very valuable. So let's talk a little bit about how we actually get to these properties. So we're not gonna go in depth super technical, but still there's gonna be some kind of tech talk in here. So if you end up feeling a little bit confused, don't worry, we're gonna circle it back to finance. Um, I'm not expecting anybody in here to have a CS background or, or understand all this, but it's really important to understand why cryptocurrencies offer what they offer. <coughs> so the first thing is something that you all may have heard of if you've heard of cryptocurrencies, and that's called the blockchain. And what the blockchain is, is it's really just a distributed database that's a ledger, kind of like a spreadsheet of all the transactions that have occurred between addresses. So you send money to you, and that's recorded on the blockchain. And this blockchain is cryptographically secured by a technology called digital signatures and proof of work algorithms. So proof of work algorithms require extensive computing to solve. And that offers a pretty interesting property of tying real world resources into these digital currencies. And digital signatures, they're cryptography for proving your ownership of funds without trust. So we'll touch a little bit more on what each of these means. So again, this blockchain is a public ledger of transactions, which are just transfers of value that have happened between people. 
a new block of transactions is processed on Bitcoin about every 10 minutes. And what a block is, is it's sim you can simply think of it as a batch processing of transactions. So every 10 minutes or so, people are sending out new transactions on the network. So you send money to you and your wallet creates a transaction that is broadcast across this global Bitcoin network. And these miners running a specialized version of the Bitcoin software pick up those transactions and they pool them together. And about every 10 minutes or so, they officially confirm that those transactions are valid and that that value transfer has occurred. And an interesting property of this is each block is cryptographically linked to the previous one. And so what that means, practically speaking, is if the current block has part of the previous block cryptographically linked to it, and that one has the previous block linked to it, it becomes very hard to undo history. These systems are mathematically designed so that if you have a transaction that occurred three or four blocks ago, the likelihood of anything happening on the network that would cause that transaction to be reversed becomes nearly impossible. <coughs> so that's where we get into proof of work. You might kind of be curious and thinking, well, this is a peer-to-peer -peer system. It's people just agreeing to run software, right? What actually stops people from pulling off fraud? Like, how do you stop somebody from spending 100 Bitcoin and then respending that same 100 Bitcoin? Well, the blockchain and proof of work solves this problem by tying in the need for real world resources to actually process these transactions. For a new block to be mined, so all these transactions to be approved, miners have to do a very, very difficult mathematical problem. The nature of this problem is the only way to solve the problem is by doing trillions and trillions of guesses. It's really a guessing game. So you'll see, you might see pictures somewhere. There are warehouses of specialized computers that people spin up to do nothing but mine Bitcoin, which means these computers are simply just eating up tons of electricity and trying to solve this guessing problem. But once the problem is solved, it turns out anybody can verify that the answer is correct instantly. So really hard to solve, really easy to verify the answer. So the way that works then is, all these transactions are being pulled together and somebody's trying to solve this problem based on that block of transactions. All these miners are guessing. When a miner finds a valid answer to this problem, it broadcasts that block and that answer out to the rest of the network. And if all the rest of the computers on the network just verify that answer, which they can do instantly, they accept that block is valid, and so they add it to the blockchain. That's how new transactions are approved, and that's how everybody can know that the transactions are valid. Because the transactions have to follow the rule set of the software, and the transactions have to be, uh, the block I should say, has to be cryptographically correct. So all of this, unlike your PayPal system, is based on mathematics and cryptography rather than trust. You don't have to trust anyone on the Bitcoin network because your little slice of the Bitcoin software that's reading the blockchain and looking for transactions is able to mathematically prove that somebody is not pulling off a fraudulent transaction on you. And because all these blocks are cryptographically linked together, remember I said it takes about 10 minutes on average to solve this math problem and add a new block. Well, since each block is based on the previous block, if you wanted to pull off a fraud and say double spend some Bitcoin that you spent six blocks ago, in order for the network to accept your fraud transaction, you would have to outmine the rest of the entire network six blocks back, which would normally take 60 minutes of guessing work in 10 minutes, in the next 10 minutes. Because the network follows the longest chain of this proof of work problem. So, the more confirmations you have, it becomes mathematically impossible for you to change history. And that's another property of these cryptocurrencies that people really like, is the immutability of things. Like, if you deposit a check in your bank account and go spend that money, somebody could come back and say, oh, whoops, that check was bad, and suck the money back out of your account in six weeks, and you're wondering, where'd my money go? If you receive a Bitcoin transaction, and you get three or four 
confirmations, you can be sure that that money is yours. And that brings up some interesting use cases for you know, settling things, like settling financial transactions on a blockchain. And finally, uh, digital signatures are another really interesting technology. And this is like kind of technical, so you know, don't freak out, it's all good. Um, you start with a private key. Okay, this is actually randomly generated, and it has to be generated using a special random, uh, random number generator called a cryptographically secure random number generator. Uh, this is not the same thing that like, generates randomness in a video game, for example. Uh, it's very important that these numbers are, are actually very, very random. You run that through an elliptic curve algorithm, and you get a public key. Now, this is a one-way function. So if you have a public key, you can't do any sort of algorithm or any sort of function to go backwards with the private key. And in the case of Bitcoin, we actually do some extra cryptography and encoding to get to the final address that you send funds to. But the really important thing is the, the public and private key. So what this means is when you send money to somebody, you're sending money to a public key. The address that you send your funds to, you can give to anybody. You can plaster your Bitcoin address on a billboard, and uh, maybe if you're lucky, some people will actually send you some Bitcoin. There's nothing private there that you have to worry about being hacked or stolen. So when you create a new transaction, what you actually do is you use your private key to do a digital signature and prove that you own the funds at that address to the rest of the network. And that digital signature algorithm means that you can share with everybody else in a transaction. You share your public key, and you share the digital signature that you created, but you don't have to share the private key at all. And so your private key, your secret key, is always secret, it's always private. Now, like, why is that important, right? What happens when you go to the store and use your credit card? What do you give them? Your credit card number, right? Is that public information? Can you put your credit card on a billboard? No. There's a lot of trust involved there. But with digital signatures, you now have a fundamentally more secure sort of way of doing payments because you never have to reveal anything private. We're actually going to get more into that later, but I wanted to give a little, little teaser on that. So is anybody a little bit confused about the technical details? Be honest. A little confused? It's totally fine. The important thing is not, the important thing to understanding Bitcoin and understanding cryptocurrencies and blockchain is not to become a tech wizard and become a nerd like me and go home and like wire stuff together and do these code projects and drive your wife crazy. You just need to understand how these properties give Bitcoin value, right? If you can understand just a little bit about, oh, that there's this, there's this algorithm in Bitcoin that means that people can't reverse transactions, and there's this algorithm that means that when I share my address with somebody, it's safe, and I don't have to reveal anything private. If you kind of get that, you can understand what gives this technology so much value. So don't be intimidated by the technical parts of this system, right? You don't have to understand how your bank does ACH transfers and communicates across the network with other banks to do a funds transfer and all that stuff. You don't have to understand HTTP to do a PayPal transfer, right? You just have to understand a rough idea of how it works and why it's useful to you. So that's what we're going to get into next. Why should I care about this as a future finance professional? So this is the corporate finance class, right? And I understand you are all CFOs for the semester, right? So you're actually running companies. You have to care about the finances and all the financial operations of a company. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about why you might actually find this technology valuable and interesting. Because it's not about why I think Bitcoin is cool. I think Bitcoin is cool because I really like cryptography and digital signatures and proof of work and software engineering. And you probably don't care, so I'm not going to like you know waste your time with that. <coughs> One of the use cases that's really interesting is really improved interoperability between institutions and organizations. 
When you do an ACH transfer from one bank to another, so say you're a company, you're gonna do a remittance to another company, or um, this even applies to us as consumers, right? Maybe you wanna transfer from one bank to another to make a loan payment. That takes days to fully clear. And the reason for that is counterparty risk, right? If I'm transferring from PNC to First National Bank, First National has to trust that PNC actually has the funds for me, they have to make sure it gets across the wire. There's a lot of risk involved, and so that takes time to clear. Cryptocurrencies, on the other hand, because of this peer-to-peer -peer protocol with proof of work and digital signature and all of that good stuff, takes minutes to fully clear. Remember that I said when you record a transaction on the blockchain, once it's a couple blocks back, it's irreversible history. The transaction can't be reversed or changed because of the nature of how the system works. So if I send Bitcoin to you and it's tens of millions of dollars for a remittance, it takes about 10 minutes to mine a block on average. So figure about an hour for six confirmations. One single hour in that transaction in no way can be reversed on the network. You can be 100% sure that, that $100 million in Bitcoin is yours. Where with ACH, that would take days. So think about the efficiency improvements that you could make in a business, especially a financial business. To have loan payments, to have remittances finished and cleared in minutes versus days versus potentially even months for certain, some wire transfers, right? More efficient transfer is more efficient business, and more efficient business is more profitable. And it's better for everybody. It's better for you as the business, and it's better for consumers. Also, think about a sound money future, right? Imagine your currency holdings, just in cash, just in what you're holding, not even in an investment growing in value over time because the system itself is designed to be more deflationary than inflationary. No more need to keep up with inflation 2-3% to every year in your investments just to break even on the purchasing power of your dollars. And imagine increased predictability in currency markets. Imagine we know how many Bitcoin, if Bitcoin is the currency of the future, are going to be in circulation versus whatever the Federal Reserve decides this week because Alan Greenspan had too much coffee or something, right? It's, it's a better future. It's better for consumers, it's better for savers, and it's better for institutions. You can model the economy much more predictably, potentially, with a technology like this because it's built on the idea of sound money scarcity and predictability. And again, this is my favorite that I touched on a little bit more. A dramatically more secure system of payments. The way that these cryptocurrencies are designed, where you never have to reveal any private information to make a payment or to receive a payment, is just inherently more secure than what we're using now. Billions and billions of dollars are spent every year on fraud prevention and the losses associated with ID theft. Credit card companies, their credit card companies model for dealing with theft and fraudulent transactions is actually literally just to throw a ton of money at the problem. They just have, they spend billions of dollars hiring people to investigate, you know, businesses <coughs> swiping your credit card again under the table or a waiter that put a $50 tip on their bill instead of a $10 tip. That's a huge waste of money when you can do it like this. So again, every time you use a credit card, you go to Target, right? Target had a big data breach, I want to say it was several years ago at this point, where they leaked millions of people's credit card information. Every single time you go to a merchant and you swipe your credit card or your debit card, you are trusting somebody else with private information. But with cryptocurrencies, the protocol is designed with public key cryptography that you never reveal any of that secret information. All you get is a public address that you keep safe in your wallet. You can, you can put the public address anywhere, and the keys are stored securely in your software, and you just use them to sign transactions. Much, much simpler, I think, and much more safe. And that means, ultimately, better value for consumers, right? Less of you spending your time as a CFO having to worry about fraud prevention and losses. And again, it's, it's more efficient that way. 
If you're the CFO of a company, especially a retail company, you're constantly worried about those sorts of issues. You're worried about chargebacks. Like people, uh, one of the reasons small businesses love cryptocurrencies is because small businesses hate chargebacks, right? Somebody gets something from you and they pay for it in their credit card and then they go to their credit card company and say, no, I, I didn't get that. And the credit card companies tend to side with the consumers, right? Because it's better for their business. It keeps, keeps customers happy. No chargebacks with Bitcoin. So somebody comes into your store, your retail store and buys something from you and they send that payment in a cryptocurrency, the money's yours. They can't say that they never got their goods. Ultimately, that's much more efficiency, much less loss for you to have to deal with. Lastly, the one that's especially, I think, an important and interesting topic for folks that are interested in finance. Should I invest in Bitcoin? No, this is my opinion. Let me, let me explain why. Okay. Cryptocurrencies right now, as, as just purely an asset class, are, it's a highly speculative market. If you dump money into Bitcoin and you try to day trade it, <coughs> try to make money on it like a penny stock, you are going to lose your pants, really. It's, it's gambling in terms of just a pure market speculative investment. Here's what you should invest in though. One of the best educators and speakers in the space, Andreas Antonopoulos says, you should invest in education. I had the privilege of actually meeting him when I was speaking at a conference in Denver uh, this past summer. He's a, he's a phenomenal person and uh, his words really resonate with me because we're 10 years young in the cryptocurrency space. Bitcoin is just 10 years old and Bitcoin was the first and many more have been released since then. That is super young for a technology. In the first 10 years of the internet, hardly anyone used it other than educational institutions and corporations. Hardly anyone had the skill set to build on top of the internet. But if you were a person that knew HTML in 1990 and you knew how to build websites for people, and you, knew, you knew how to build web applications, you made bank. You were valuable as a professional because you had a set of knowledge that other people didn't have. So I think it's critical and important for people across fields, for computer scientists like myself, for people in marketing, for legal professionals, for finance professionals like yourself, invest some time in learning about these technologies and how they work and why they're valuable. You're already taking a good step by just coming to class today and having this dialogue. You're gonna be valuable in the future as young professionals that know how this technology works as it continues to grow. And I think, I do think you should have some cryptocurrency. I think you should have some, I think you should use it. Cryptocurrency is really interesting. I find that I would rather pay for anything I can in cryptocurrency than with my debit card. Because it is more secure, it's fast, it's easy. And it's, it's just interesting, right? Go on an exchange, get some cryptocurrency, use it. And you can save some too, right? You know, I have some savings in cryptocurrency just like I have some to spend. That's the same thing that I do with my US dollars. I don't spend my whole paycheck, I save some. But I don't advise considering cryptocurrencies to be an investment. I would not do what people did in 2017, which is people actually went out and got mortgages and took their student loans and put them into Bitcoin. And then the market crashed and the price is still, still quite a bit down from where it was. So don't gamble on it. Learn how to use it, use it. Invest in your future as a professional by learning how it works. I think it's a bright future of money. I really don't think the cryptocurrencies are going anywhere. There were plenty of people that were very skeptical about the internet in 1990. Uh, many obituaries have been written for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies already, and they're still strong. We're still seeing amazing use cases come out daily. We're seeing new advances in the technology. We're seeing more and more people like yourself get a little bit curious about what this Bitcoin thing <clears throat> is and start using it. So with that, uh, one fun thing before we get to questions. While we're doing Q&A, totally have my permission to pull your phone or your laptop out. If you would like to, you can go to the app store of your choice and there's two wallets that I use and recommend that I know are secure and good wallets. Um, the Bitcoin.com wallets or Coinomi, 
Um, they're both multi-asset wallets that let you do a couple different cryptocurrencies. You can download and install that. Um, set up a Bitcoin Cash wallet. Now, Bitcoin Cash is a fork of Bitcoin. It's, it's a different cryptocurrency um, that I prefer for various uh, reasons. It's more tailored towards this daily use, like buy your coffee with it, low fees and that sort of thing. So just make sure you don't get confused. Set up a Bitcoin Cash BCH wallet and see me at the end and I will give you some free Bitcoin Cash. So free money. Everybody loves free money. Your students, I know. I was there two years ago. And with that, thanks again, everybody, for your attention. And uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. We can go uh, as long as the class permits. So you're obviously on, like you said, the yes side of Bitcoin. But I think it's interesting that you say don't invest in it yet. So as a software engineer, what I guess cryptocurrency as a whole, what is the main problem that they that needs to be addressed for you to say yes, invest in it? So I would like to see, there's, there's a couple moving parts to that, right? I would like to see more adoption before people would consider it a, a safe investment. And, and the, here's the reason. When you look at the total market cap of Bitcoin and even all cryptocurrencies together, like the total amount in circulation in its US dollar value, right? It's somewhere in the hundreds of billions for Bitcoin, you know, billions for like Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum and some of the other major ones. That is a really, really tiny economy compared to the US dollar economy, the Euro economy. So what that means is small movements in the market, small movements in uh, you know, perception and that sort of thing, just like with stocks, means huge movements in the price. So if you watch price charts for like Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, you can see it go up and down tens of percent, percentage points in a day in terms of like what the US dollar value is. Right, so I have some you know, Bitcoin Cash sitting around, I like to use it, and one day my wallet went from like $150 worth of value to like $250 worth of value. And the reason is, is the economies are just really small. Now I think as more people adopt this and actually use it, the overall market caps are gonna go up, it's gonna have more value. And as the size of the economy grows relative to the stock market economy, the US dollar economy, the less volatile the market becomes. And so for me, it's just a matter of safety, right? Like I said, I think that if you just treat Bitcoin as a speculative investment, and a lot of people do, and a lot of people get wrapped up in the price discussions, you're just gonna see your money bounce up and down all day, you're gonna make a stupid decision, like you're gonna put money in, you're gonna see it crash, and then you're gonna wanna get out at a big loss. It's just not, I don't think it's wise, right? Um, that said, again, I do think you should have some and use some. I think it's really cool. I think it's going to grow in the future and be a, a very valuable asset class and an important form of money. I just think that right now, as you're especially starting your career as a young professional, you want to keep that to a reasonable portion of your net worth. Right? Like if, if the market went to zero tomorrow, which I don't think is going to happen, but it could, I'm not going to lose my house because I had too much money tied up in, in Bitcoin. Right? And that's, that's really important. So that's, that's the distinction that I make. And I totally get that like the distinction between, hey, maybe you should keep some of this and save it, like a savings account versus investing is, is really nebulous, right? There's, no, there's not actually a, a difference in that other than mentality. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, so if the issue is that not, a pe not enough people use it, if I understood that correctly, why are there so many different cryptocurrencies that pop up? Like why wouldn't the community say, well, we just need to focus on one so that's a really interesting question. Um, a broader discussion in the community. There is a group of people that are what we generally call like Bitcoin maximalists. Bitcoin was the original cryptocurrency, right? And a lot have come out since. A lot of them are still pretty major players. There's a, there's a group of people that are pretty vocal that say Bitcoin is really the only good one. Everything else, as they call it, they call it shit coins. Um, I'm going to tell you, like, I'm really vocally against that mentality. Different cryptocurrencies, just like different operating systems, different word processing software, different cars, <clears throat> solve different problems for different cases. Bitcoin does things very differently than Ethereum. Like Ethereum is a smart contract network, and I'm not gonna get into what that means, but you can do very different things with Ethereum that you can do with Bitcoin, even though they're both cryptocurrencies that you can trade around, right? Bitcoin Cash is a fork of Bitcoin, emerged because of a serious debate in the community about how they were going to scale 
and what people were going to use the currency for. Is it going to be an investment as a store of value like gold? Is it a digital gold? Versus is this a currency that we should adopt? Right? So different, I realize it's kind of a long answer, but the reason is, is different coins solve different problems. I'm a strong believer, and I think many other people in the space are strong believers, that what we're going to see over time is you know, many of the thousands of cryptocurrencies that there exist are going to die off, but there's going to be 10, 20, 30 major players that remain, right? You know, like, I'm a Subaru guy, right? But, like, Subarus aren't for everybody. Like, you might need, like, a, a minivan or something. You might need, like, you know, you might want a truck, right? Different currencies solve different problems. And so I, I'm with you in that. In a sense, that hampers adoption a little bit because people aren't sure what to get into, but I think you should just get into a little bit of everything with the major stuff and see which one works for you, right? Yeah. Right. You had a question? Yeah. So I was, uh, I was doing my taxes last night, right? and there was a question, did you buy or sell currency? So if you're a company, say you only, it's a, you're a small local business, why don't you do everything through Bitcoin? Because if it's decentralized, how does the government find out? You're so. There is two parts to that question. Um, the first question is just technologically is, is privacy with cryptocurrencies. Um, most of these major ones like Bitcoin, Ethereum, they're all actually, the, the way that the blockchain works is it's a totally public ledger. It's pseudonymous, but it's not anonymous. Like your address isn't tied to you as a person, as an identity. But if somebody knows that address is tied to you, they can track the transfer of value between addresses because it's, all, it's on a public ledger. So the way that the IRS generally finds out about people dodging taxes when they've been doing heavy Bitcoin trading is through exchanges. The networks themselves, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever, they're decentralized, right? You can just get the currency, you can trade it between people. Um, you know, there's nothing stopping that. But exchanges, on the other hand, where you go from Bitcoin to US dollars or euros or something, they have very specific requirements because they're financial institutions. When you sign up for a Coinbase account, they do what's called KYC, Know Your Customer, and AML, Anti-Money Laundering Operations. They're gonna ask for your ID, they're gonna find out who you are, because they have to. And you know that's where the IRS kind of gets involved. Like if you like paid off your house last year and you said you made like $20,000, and all this Bitcoin stuff was going on on Coinbase, like that's where you're going to get hit with that. Because at some point, generally speaking for most people, it, your value transfers will get tied to your real identity. There are a lot of technologies that are emerging now to help make Bitcoin and other public ledgers more private. There's also privacy coins like Monero and Zcash that their protocols are built differently where you can't track the value going between different addresses. So that's technologically being addressed. Uh, the other thing that was in your question is the, just the overall question of taxes on cryptocurrencies. Right now, the IRS treats it as an asset class like stocks. So if you trade, like if you get some Bitcoin and it goes up $1,000 in value, like what your holdings are, and then you trade that Bitcoin back to US dollars, you have to pay capital gains tax on that $1,000. Technically speaking, which is a huge pain in the ass for people like me that believe you should use Bitcoin as currency, technically speaking, every time you spend some cryptocurrency, it is a, ta it is a taxable event, and you have to keep track of that. Now, I'm not going to tell anybody here to like, not do their taxes on that. Like, I keep track of that stuff at, at enough of a level that I can like, properly report that you know, to, a, to you know, a reasonable dollar amount. Um, like I think if you know you get two hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin cash and you like buy a phone with it, like I did, you probably don't need to worry about it. But if you're a big time trader, if you're if you're spending thousands of dollars in cryptocurrency, the reality is, is right now is that's a taxable thing. You have to worry about capital gains and capital losses, and that is a bit of a hamper on the massive scalable adoption of this. But I'm hoping that as more people pick this up and treat it as a currency and not as a store of value investment, that sort of thing, that the IRS is going to change their tune. So again, sorry, long answer, but I wanted to talk about the two, the two parts of that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, if it does get like, adopted like, on a like, large base, do you think there's any like, implications on, I know like, a big thing is companies collecting like, data to like, build pro like, customer profiles. 
do you think there's going to be like a negative impact on that, a positive impact? So I think it has the potential to be a positive impact. And here's why. Like right now, all that stuff is flowing through centralized companies like Visa, like PayPal, like Venmo, who has no problem making a dollar selling other companies your information about your payments and stuff to sell you ads, mm -hmm. right? Every, all the digital payments that occur that are not like cash transfers of US dollars go through centralized institutions which collect data on you and can do pretty much whatever they want with that data. With cryptocurrencies, the problem becomes if somebody can, because they're, they're not private by nature necessarily, if somebody knows that this address belongs to you and they see all the inflow and outflow, they can build a profile on you. Um, however, again, privacy is a big um, part of the community right now, a big part of the community discussion. Uh, people are putting extensive work into making these decentralized ledgers more private now because people realize that that's a concern that you know the way that the system works means that information is revealed about your payments that they can tie it back to you. So things like cash shuffle and cash fusion on Bitcoin Cash are being designed so that uh, you have some money in your wallet and in the background it's being shuffled with other people so they can't track you through blockchain analysis. You could use privacy coins like Monero or Zcash and that sort of thing to not be tracked. So as it stands right now, I don't think it makes a huge impact because of the public nature of the protocol, but we can build in privacy technology that's being developed and then nobody can track you or steal your data. So, one more question. One more question, okay. Do you ever fear that somebody could create like, a computer that was capable of um, running algorithms fast enough to basically beat the system and create fraudulent transactions? Awesome question. Um, no, I don't. And here's why. The network effect is really, really huge. Um, the amount of computing power that goes into mining all the major cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, I don't think that like in the US government's like secret NSA supercomputer stores, they don't have enough power to edge out the 51% that they need to attack the network. It's just because there's so much, such a high volume of computing power spread out across a global network that you can't amass enough to actually cause a problem in the chain. And if I have time, I wanna address one more thing that's pretty interesting because I did a tutorial on this that you can check out on my website. Um, private keys, right? So you have this random number that's a, that's a cryptographic key. Can somebody hack that? Can somebody like, you know how if your password gets leaked, people can like try to guess what your password is and steal it? The good news is nobody can do that with Bitcoin private keys. The numbers are so astronomically huge that you would actually, um, like it would take orders of magnitude longer than the universe has even been in existence to run through all the possibilities. That's how big the numbers are. And even if you could build a theoretical computer that could do that amount of computing, it would take more energy that's available in the solar system to do that. Uh, and so your private keys are very, very safe. Good stuff. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, everyone. All right, so any questions? Gotta be a few. Yes, sir. Uh, with 5G coming out, like a lot of networks and habits, do you think that it's going to be able to be transferred in real time soon? Okay, that's a really good question. So, Bitcoin is already real time transferable in, in the sense of like propagating a transaction on the network. So, um, for example, with Bitcoin Cat, there's some differences with Bitcoin BTC now. Um, but Bitcoin Cash has something called zero conf or zero confirmation payments. Essentially, it, when you send a transaction to somebody on Bitcoin Cash, you create the transaction with your wallet, you do the digital signature. So your wallet like accumulates your little digital dollar bills that you can spend, creates a transaction. And what it does is it actually uses a flood model. It simply finds all the network peers that it can and it sends out that transaction to everyone. The receiver of that transaction, if it's a pretty small amount of money, it's pretty safe for them to go ahead and accept that payment because the way Bitcoin Cash works, you cannot reverse the payment um, even when it's not confirmed. What can happen though is 
you know, the conditions on the network can make it such that maybe that doesn't get fully confirmed. Does that, that kind of make sense so far? Now, when a transaction is fully processed, it's called confirmed, that's when it's included in a block that's mined. So that process, the time that that takes is governed by the difficulty of the mining algorithm. On Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, that's designed so that happens about every 10 minutes on average. So it's pretty consistently, you send a transaction out and it's actually fully confirmed in about 10 minutes. But the transaction is generally available in the receiver's wallet, like sent across the network instantly anyway. So yeah, does that, does that answer your question? Now, I know it's kind of technical, but I didn't want to answer the question wrong technically. Um, Bitcoin BTC has a different technology in it called replace by fee, where if you create a payment and um, because of their scaling approach, if the payment is not being confirmed fast enough for your liking, you can rebroadcast the transaction to the network with a higher fee. And so that can't that does mean that the transaction would be changed. So you can't quite as a merchant accept that right away for like a ten dollar payment. Now, if you're using a system that has the zero comp where you're not allowed to change anything about the transaction when it's broadcast. If it's a $10 coffee, you're pretty much safe to assume the money's yours. If you sell somebody your car for Bitcoin, you really want to wait until it's been confirmed a couple times and can't be reversed. Hopefully that makes sense. Kind of a long answer, but yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Um, so you're talking about like really the benefits of using cryptocurrency in terms of making payments more efficient, more secure. Is there any reason that a company would not um, use cryptocurrency to make a payment, or is it just that people don't know about it that much? So it's a matter of adoption, right? Some, a lot of major companies still haven't started accepting it yet just because they don't think there's a, enough value in it. Um, but a lot of major companies are. So um, who here uh, has AT&T for their phone plan? Okay, AT&T actually accepts Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Ethereum through a payment processor called BitPay. And what that means is I can pay my phone bill in Bitcoin Cash. For them though, they don't want to hold on to the cryptocurrency because the price goes up and down a lot. Still, it's very volatile. So what those payment processors like BitPay allow is I pay them in Bitcoin Cash, BitPay settles that transaction for them in US dollars. So I get to pay in Bitcoin and I get all the benefits of that more secure payment model. And at the end of the day, they get all their transactions in their bank account as US dollars. So it's not, a purely peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin payment, but you get the best of both worlds. So the payment processor sits in the middle and allows that to go on. Uh, Newegg accepts Bitcoin, like my latest phone uh, and my laptop that I actually use daily, I bought with Bitcoin Cash. Because I, like I like to do that versus give people my credit card if I can. You had one as well. Yeah. Right? I was going to ask, um, so obviously like you said, it's a very speculative market right now. How long do you foresee it being before it becomes less speculative, or do you think it will never? Um, I, I think it will get there. I would hope sooner rather than later, but I don't know. And the reason for the volatility that we talked about in the last class as well is it's about the total market cap. Bitcoin BTC has the highest market cap of all cryptocurrencies right now, and it's like the hundreds of billions in terms of the total value of all Bitcoin in circulation. Uh, some of the other players like Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Litecoin, they're in the billions of dollars, right? That's actually a really, really small economy compared to the stock market economy, the US dollar economy, the euro economy. And so small bits of perception and even manipulation sometimes in the market can make the price go up and down wildly. Um, Andreas Antonopoulos likens it to, um, imagine taking a canoe out on a rough ocean versus a cruise liner, right? The cruise liner doesn't feel the volatility as much as the small boat does. So what we need is we need a lot more people using it and that's going to take time because there's a chicken and the egg problem there. People don't want to use it. Businesses don't necessarily want to accept it outright without a payment processor because currency goes up and down a lot. Uh, and then more people using it makes it less volatile. So you need to have that sort of, we need to sort of hit that adoption acceleration to get there. My overall thought is I think that there, I mean, there are thousands of these cryptocurrencies out there. Um, I think we're gonna see like 10, 20, 30 major ones that solve different problems in interesting ways are gonna kind of settle out and ultimately be what's in the market. I am not a maximalist that believes one coin is going to be the winner take all. 
because it's like any other tool. You know, certain tools like Bitcoin does certain things well, Bitcoin Cash does certain things well, Ethereum does certain things well. So I think we're gonna ultimately stabilize out into a market that is, you know, a couple major currencies. It, who knows how long that's gonna take? It, it could be 10 years, it could be 20, it could be 50. Uh, I do think that that's coming, but I, I can't tell you when. How, uh, how complicated is the process? To cre actually create a coin? Yeah. Like you want to make your own crypto? No, it's not me personally, but like can banks make their own coins or something like that? Yeah, so the biggest one in the news recently, the tribe, was Facebook. Facebook wanted to create their own corporate version of cryptocurrency called Libra. And they actually got shut down by federal regulators. Um, there's not much value in a, in a corporate institution creating their own coin because it defeats the purpose of decentralization. Like if Facebook makes their own cryptocurrency, it's just a really fancy way of doing Venmo. It doesn't bring these interesting properties to the table. Now, I will tell you this. If you would like to, what's your name? John. John. If you would like to create John coin, you can actually do that, and you can do that by creating a token. One of the interesting things you can do with cryptocurrencies is certain chains like uh, Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin Cash, EOS, some other ones, they allow you to create tokens that are like your own currency on top of their blockchain. So some of the major cryptocurrencies you might see, like basic attention token with the Brave browser, um, DAI, like there's different stable coins and stuff. They're actually tokens that operate on top of Ethereum. And that's pretty easy to do. I, um, I did a prototype of this concept called tokenization. I won't go too far into this. I put my lawnmower on the blockchain. I represented my lawn tractor I have at home as a, as a token uh, to do this proof of concept project for a tutorial. And it, was, it took me five minutes to issue a new token. Now that token is totally worthless because nobody wants my lawnmower token. <laughs> but uh, it brings up an interesting future where people can do things like you could create a token to represent your car. Like we could collectively agree on instead of taking titles to the DMV and trading titles through a government agency and handing over keys, you could represent your car as a token on a blockchain. And if you want to sell your car to him, you just transfer him the token. And then his cryptocurrency wallet will start the car for you. So that's like a proof of concept I built out with my like lawnmower and the Raspberry Pi and all this fun stuff. There's a video out on it, but to give you an idea of some of the things you can build on top of these, it's 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 interesting stuff. So with new cryptocurrencies, how long should you wait until you buy into it? So you like buy into it, like you want to? Yeah, like you buy. A it just depends on what you want to use it for. I mean, like I said, I don't recommend treating them as speculative assets, like you're trying to make money on it. Um, you know, if, if it's a coin that solves a problem that's interesting to you, go for it, right? That's, that's what I would do. Like, say a, a company, you know, say some open source organization comes out with a new coin that um, does something interesting and you think that's a really cool use case, I would, I would buy into it, I would buy some. Um, and you might get lucky and you might you know, actually make some money on that. Uh, but, you know, thousands of these have spun up and kind of sputtered out. I mean, if you say, like, I'm going to create a new token and then, you know, hopefully it pumps up in value and then I sell it all, it's not, not really anything interesting there other than making a block, I guess. Does that answer the like, your question? Yeah. I, I just, I mean, I wouldn't put money in anything I don't believe in, right? I don't, I use crypto coins that I think are interesting. Like there's four or five that I use on a regular basis that are pretty you know, major players in the space. I use them because I think they all do interesting things. I don't really like buy new tokens and hope I get rich on them. It's kind of a kind of a gambling game. How are we on time? Good. Yeah, we have about five more minutes if anybody has anything else. Yeah. So I don't really understand that question, but that's like, a good. So how does that work? Like, I get how you could send money like from peer to like person to person, like send it mm -hmm. to your friends and that stuff. But like, what kind of transactions can you actually use it for? Like in day to day, like can I walk into Walmart and use Bitcoin? Yeah. So, like I said, it's adoption is coming up. A lot of major companies still aren't on it yet. Um, it's popular actually sometimes in restaurants and small businesses. The reason there like there's a food truck in Pittsburgh that takes Bitcoin and Litecoin. Mm -hmm. They really like it because there's no chargebacks. Once you send the transaction, they have the money. 
you can't like call your Bitcoin credit card company and be like, no, I didn't get that sandwich and have the payment reversed. They like it for that. Um, AT&T, Newegg are some major online retailers. It's very popular for online use because of that same reason, right? The online merchant gets the payment right away and they can send you the stuff without having to worry about fraud or chargebacks. So it's growing. Um, if you have anything in particular you like to buy often, I could probably find you a website where you could pay for it with Bitcoin. Interesting. Okay. But yeah, it's it's still it's still going to be a while, I think, before you can go to like most major gas stations or Walmart and pay with Bitcoin. But getting there. Yeah. So there's no censorship um, when using the cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. Is there any sort of regulation with that? Like, if there's someone in the United States, who they find us, you know, sending money to a terrorist organization overseas, can anybody do anything? Um, they, so, you can certainly take legal action if you know who the person is. Um, the way that you find out, like, the way that you tie a person to a Bitcoin address is usually through exchanges. So if you sign up for a Coinbase account, which is an exchange to pay you know, with your debit card to get $20 worth of Bitcoin, you have to tell them who you are. Those are called KYC, Know Your Customer Regulations, and AML, Anti-Money Laundering. So any time that there's a transfer going between a cryptocurrency and a, and a fiat currency, they're usually gonna figure out who you are first to prevent that. In terms of purely peer-to-peer, -peer, like I have Bitcoin, I want it to send to somebody on the other end, um, and just use it as Bitcoin, nothing you can do to stop it. Now, again, somewhat of a political discussion, right? There are certainly use cases of that that are just, just plain evil. Like, I mean, you can think about terrorism, child pornography. Um, there are usually other ways other than stopping the Bitcoin payments to stop those people, right? There are other ways to break that website to find out who those terrorists are. But, you know, again, depending on your leanings, right, that can be a good thing. Um, anybody here know what the Silk Road was? So the Silk Road was a free marketplace that popped up on Tor. Um, so it was a secret hidden website. They, it, it's really hard to figure out who runs that website. And you could buy and sell anything you wanted on there um, as a free market, except for they had their own free market morals. You were not allowed to trade in people's stolen information or child pornography or anything like that. But like. Drugs, for example, like if you wanted to buy marijuana and have it shipped to you or psychedelic mushrooms or something, that was a totally free marketplace where you were allowed to do that and it used Bitcoin. The modern ones use privacy coins like Monero. Now, okay, maybe slightly controversial, right? Some people could say that's bad or illegal or immoral. Like I'm, I'm pretty libertarian on that kind of stuff. I think like, wow, a totally free digital market where I can buy things that probably shouldn't be illegal using currencies that can't be censored. I'm like, that is a cool use case. <laughs> That depends on how you lean, but um, again, to answer your question, generally, you can't you can't stop a Bitcoin transaction from happening. Period. It's just it's it's baked into the protocol that that is not something you can do. But you can use lots of other law enforcement tactics and methods to stop people from doing things that are truly bad. And you know, ultimately, the Silk Road was found out. They found out the guy that made it. He's he's serving double life in prison, which. Um, I'll be willing to take a stance on and say is a total injustice, but um, you know, those things are out there, and we can figure out ways to enforce it without having to have censorable payments.